Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, and on this episode of Better Off, we've got one of the three co-founders of Home Depot, Ken Langone. And we used to go to my grandparents in Port Washington for lunch every Sunday. This they all got together. We would drive through a wealthy section of town called Roslyn Estates. Every time we drive through there, mom would say to me, I was sitting in the back of the panel truck. She was sitting in the front on a, on a makeshift chair seat. And she'd say, would you like to live here someday? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going to have to work hard and get an education. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest online financial advisor. We've got a great treat for you today. It is an interview with Ken Langone. He is one of the three co-founders of Home Depot. He's a former director of the New York Stock Exchange. He is a guy who has been in business for decades and therefore has phenomenally hysterical, interesting, engaging stories. And so when you listen to this guy, you know he speaks from his heart. He came from nothing. His twists and turns in his career were really motivated by what was available. He made the most of it. He's a billionaire now, but a totally normal guy. Got to tell you, he comes into the studio, no entourage, no publisher, no publicist, no driver, no nothing. Just himself. He walks in. That was that. So uh, check it out. He's got a new book. It's called I Love Capitalism, an American Story. Ken Langone, up now here at Better Off. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Ken Langone, co-founder of The Home Depot, author, philanthropist, and uh, all-around great ambassador for the Italian-American community. Welcome to Better Off. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. We start the show with a very simple question. Hmm? What's the best financial decision you've ever made? And you've made a lot of them. Oh. Stump the DJ. No. Um... I'd have to say the very best financial decision I made was the decision that I thought Ross Perot's company was so unique that it was worth an extraordinary value far beyond what anybody else did. So the company was Electronic Data Systems, yes, EDS, and um, we're going to get into how you got to the position where you became his investment banker, right. but you brought that company public. It'll be 50 years of September. Oh, my God. That was something to put on your calling card. So let's go back in time a little bit. You were born to uh, Italian-American parents on the North Shore of Long Island. Yep. They, who's first generation, your grandparents or your parents? My parents are first generation. Your parents are first generation. Working class. Dad was a plumber? My father was a plumber. He went to the eighth grade. Yeah. My mother worked in a school cafeteria. She went to the seventh grade. And you lived on what you sort of describe as like the bad side of the tracks well, in was, a nice it town. Where, it was where the poor people lived. Yeah. You know, we had a, I think my parents paid $4,000 for the house they bought, which they couldn't buy. and They were living, renting the house for a few years. It was, it was uh, right by the public school. How is it that your parents, who were not educated were so encouraging that you become educated? Because a lot of people who grew up as tradespeople, children of tradespeople, mm-hmm. go into the trade. My father made me learn to be a plumber. On weekends in high school, I used to help him. So I could do all the things a plumber does, wipe a joint, hit a, hit a joint for copper tubing with lead, uh, thread a pipe, cut pipe, all this, this stuff. This is great because I need some work on my, uh, well, go my apartment. Go to Home Depot. We've oh. got a lot of people... <laughs> That can really help you. And we got great prices and everything you need, okay? Okay, so you learn you learn the trade, but but what was it that they knew about being educated? My parents, God bless them, didn't blame themselves for where they were. They felt if they had the chance for an education, they'd have done better than they did. And we used to go to my grandparents in Port Washington for lunch every Sunday. This they all got together. We would drive through a wealthy section of town called Ross on Estates. And when we would drive through there, every time we drive through there, mom would say to me, I was sitting in the back of the panel truck. She was sitting in the front on a, on a makeshift chair seat. And she'd say, would you like to live here someday? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going to have to work hard and get an education. So she okay. knew. Okay. Well, they understood because they knew they could be capable of doing so much more, but they lacked the tickets. And meanwhile, you, they're telling you be educated. And you say you weren't such a great student. I, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to make money. I hear you. You say it in, like, very plain English Wait, right here on page six. I loved making money. Yeah, I was, hell, I, 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 I delivered newspapers. I was a caddy. 
I worked in a gas station. I worked in a butcher shop. I used to take the cardboard out from the liquor store. There was a supermarket in Rawlins called M&H that opened up. At the same time, I was working for the butcher shop, which was a competitor. At nights, I was helping them set up the store without the butcher shop knowing I was working two jobs. I mean, it's interesting. You say... I was never academically curious, and I didn't apply myself at all. So, But you did say math came easy to you, so that was was, good. Numbers were just like that. Tell me about how you then headed to Bucknell University. How'd you get there? Understand that that I did okay in high school. Numbers and me got along very well, and I still do. Mm -hmm. I had pretty much convinced myself that I wasn't a student, and I wanted to go into the Marine Corps in 1953 because the Korean War was still on. Mm Mm-hmm. My brother was in the Army, my older brother. I only had one brother. And I took the position that this is what I wanted to do. Well, Eisenhower had different plans at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So I said, what am I going to do? And I went to see friends of mine from Port Washington, Jim McNamara, J.R. Davis, Stan Cutler. They were at Bucknell. Uh, I went there, and it was house party weekend. I said, Jesus, this is what you do in college. (laughs) I could do this really well. Well, this fits me. Yes, I can execute on this. So they had Saturday morning classes, and that morning, that Saturday morning, they said, look, we have to go to class. Why don't you go over and see the guy over in the building over there? He's the guy that lets people in. It was called the registrar. His name was George Faint. And I went over, and I said, he said, I'm sitting there, and he said, what are you waiting for? I said, well, my friend said I should come see you. What about? I said, well, I'm in high school. You're a senior? I said, yeah, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He said, well, come on in my office. So we talked for an hour. The following Thursday, I get a letter from him that if I want to come to Bucknell, He'd be happy to have me. That may be the best decision that anyone from Bucknell ever made. No, the best decision anybody from Bucknell ever made, Yeah, and it's in the book, was my economics professor who wanted to know if anybody ever told me I was stupid. And I said, yes, everybody. And he said to me, you know the only sin? You believed it. And That's he great said, advice. And he said to me, how are you doing in your other classes? I said, about as bad as I'm doing in your class. He said, well, you know, you're going to be out of here in January. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said to me, is that what you want to happen? I said, no, I don't. He's okay. He said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll reach out to all your other professors. You promise me you'll work, give it everything you got, and we'll see if we can pull you out of this nosedive. And they did. It's something interesting to me that many people will say the difference between someone making it and not making it. Whether and you, I know you're involved in the charter school movement. Right. It can be anyone from a coach, a music teacher, an academic mm-hmm. teacher mm-hmm. who just says, hey, you, you, Ken. What's going on here? And they see something in you. Yeah. Look, every place I look, I see people that I know have helped me to do what I've done. And in many cases, have done more than I've done myself. And that is why you say you are not a self-made man. I am the furthest thing from a self-made man you'll ever know. Okay? And my regret on that, not regret, I hope I didn't, I I don't know how many hundreds of names there are in there, but I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But if I did, it was a bad memory. Not that they didn't participate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you left college and you uh, said you're going to go, you, you know, it's like uh, where the bank robber goes, he's going to go to the bank. Uh, that's where the money is. Right. You said the money's in Wall Street. So yeah. you graduate and you go talk to some folks. I do love this advice uh, from uh, Maurice Hart. And he says, quote, let me tell you the lay of the land. We have Jewish firms for Jewish kids. We have WASP firms for WASP kids. The Irish, we make the clerks. We put them on the floor of the stock exchange. Ica- Italian kids like you, we put in the back office. What did you think when you heard that? Uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that he was discrimination. But I know one thing. I made my mind up. That ain't going to hold me back. You have no idea the price we're paying for our entitlement system in America. Not the money, but the number of people that don't get a chance to develop self-respect by doing it for themselves. You've got to respect yourself first before you're going to respect anybody else. Somebody who has no respect for themselves has a difficult time seeing good in somebody else. I, I view that more as an opportunity than as a setback. But I always, I admired him. He was with a firm called New York Hanseatic. And I so admired him for being so thoroughly blunt with me. Yeah. I mean, there is a, listen, I grew up on a trading floor, so bluntness you know, certainly. Well, and think about the Irishman and Italian kids. I knew, exactly what, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Right. And my dad was, you know, like the Jewish kid who, who went yeah, to precisely. Like, whatever. He, this is where you can go. So I want to talk a little bit about how you did get into Wall Street selling securities. Mm-hmm. And that was in the early 60s. And, and talk a little bit about what you did and how you then ultimately met Ross Perot. Okay. 
I was called back. I was in the Army once in, in 58 for six months. And then I got called back when they built the wall around Berlin in 61. When I got out in June of 62, I made my, Wall Street had had the biggest crash it had had since 1929 in May. And everybody was leaving Wall Street. And I said, hey, this is my moment to strike. And my father-in-law, God bless him, he was in the business. And he set me up with a series of appointments. And the fact that people were leaving and the firms were cutting back, I kept going. I, I really was getting discouraged, but I wasn't going to give up. I had a wife and one child and a second one due in September of that year. And I met a man, and he said to me, I'd like to hire you. His name was Jack Cullen. He said, I'd like to hire you. But he said, we're cutting back, and we just can't do it. And I said, but he said, I think you're going to be a big success. He said, I think you got certain talent. I said, what's that? He said, well, you strike me as a very sensitive guy, and that's a great, great talent to have hmm. if you're going to sell. So he thanked me and said he couldn't help me. And I got in the elevator, and I went down to the floor, down to the lobby, and I got well, thought to myself, I said, wait a minute, I went right back upstairs, and I said, I'd like to see Mr. Cullen again. And I went in, and he said, what's up? Did you forget something? I said, no. I said, let me ask you a question. What do you pay a secretary? He said, we pay him about 150 bucks a week. I said, can you pay me as a secretary? He said, what do you mean? I said, can you pay me 150 a week? He said, well, you can't make it on that. I said, no, that's my problem. I was teaching at NYU at night. Mm. By the way, consider this, barely... Ten years from when I was told I was going to get thrown out of college, I'm now teaching at one of the great business programs in the country. And so I said, I'll make it. Don't worry about it. So then I said, but there's only one condition. You have to give me every account you're not doing business with. And boy, then I went to work. That's great. And so you were selling. Selling like crazy. And you are a salesman at heart. I love selling. Even things. if you love the numbers, the selling, you're a relationship guy. That's the sensitivity that it's he saw. It's all about the people. Absolutely. And that includes companies. Mm -hmm. Great companies are run by great people. Home Depot is a success it is because we had people like Bernie and Arthur and Pat. These were our partners when we started the company. Mm -hmm. All right, And these men were unique and special in every respect. All right, let's get back to Ross Press. How'd you meet him? I went to a party in Washington in, uh, in 1968. And I met a man there who said he was Perot's partner and Washington representative. I didn't know who the hell Perot was. I didn't know what he did. And he started telling me, and I said, gee, that sounds like that's interesting. And he said to me, I said, gee, I said, is there a chance I can get in to meet this man? He says, well, call me on Monday. I'll see what I can do. The name was Jack Height. I called Jack on Monday. He said, look, you got an appointment. He said, two things. You got 30 minutes. And he said, don't use any bad words. So I said, And you're oh, a little rough on the, on the bad words. So. I am what I am. I know, me too. Okay can't do it here but it is yeah what it is. i understand you know if you live in a trading room long enough that becomes that's part exactly of, that becomes part of the territory mm -hmm. so anyway i went down and i met with him and exactly at the point i was supposed to get in i got into his office and we were 30 minutes and for 29 and a half minutes he told me everything he'd heard from goldman sachs whitewell merrill lynch clark dodge gh all these firms that were really trying to get his deal and when he got all done it was about 30 seconds left and he said to me what do you think of what I just said? And I think, well, I blew the 30-minute rule, right? Right. So I said, Mr. Perot, I said, pardon me, that's the biggest pile of horseshit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that's awesome. And he looked back, he took back, and he said, what do you mean? And we talked for 13 hours. We talked till 1 o'clock the next morning. Good God. I had not brought any clothes down, so he was driving us around Dallas looking for a drugstore where I could buy some toiletries and a T-shirt. Oh, my God. And we found out in that meeting we were married the same hour, the same day, the same year. His values and his integrity was so precious. And I, I said to him, I said, I'll never throw a curve at you. And he said, oh, he said I was going to make a decision by Friday. This was Wednesday. He says, I'm going to put it off. He said, let's get to know each other better. So over three months, uh, he played with my head a couple of times. One time he called me and said, you know, he said, Ken, the thing that bothers me about you is you don't show your enthusiasm very well. I said, what? I'll be down there in five yeah, minutes. Right. You think that this thing, which is basically builds like the electronic infrastructure for big municipalities. No, what they did was they ran data processing operations. They, were called out, they weren't called outsourcing them, but that's what they were. They would send their highly trained, capable programmers and scientists into these companies and help them get the most they could get out of their computers. It's amazing. So you then become the guy who runs 
the firm where the where they well, said Well, I I got that deal. I'd been made a partner before that. I was made a partner in 66. I got that deal and I felt pretty good about my I was kind of full of myself, frankly. <laughs> you know, I think today I might be less arrogant than I was then, but I was floating around. I got this deal from all these other firms and I did it and blah blah blah. By the way, I didn't do it alone. Again, mm -hmm. uh, we had a team of people at Pressbridge that were fabulous. And when I gave this big number to Pro, 100 times earnings was an unheard of multiple. Yeah, and you got more than that. He got 115. He thought when he asked me driving through the tunnel to sign the papers in Jersey, he said, well, this is what you're going to tell me. I'm not getting 100. I said, you're right. And he got a little perplexed. And his wife, Margo, was in the car with me. And we were in the back seat of a limousine, two seats, looking at each other. And I said, yeah, you're not going to get 100 times earnings. He said, see, Margo, they're all alike up here, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, look, if you want 100, that's okay with me. So then Margo said, well, what were you going to do with it? I said, well, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but if you only want 100. Yeah, that's fine. We did it at 115 times earnings, by the way. It was a good do, as it we was, say. It was, and by the way, I think of that company with enormous respect. They had, they had the most wonderful people in the company. They were motivated. They were high class. They were very professional. Lots of military people in that f bunches company, of. Don't right? forget, this is this is kids coming out of Vietnam. Yeah. We had and he had these kids, and he gave them opportunities. Mm -hmm. He gave them awesome responsibilities and the ability to make decisions. And if they made bad decisions, it wasn't the end of their career. So I want to just flash forward, and I would love for you to tell the story of Bernie Marcus. Arthur Blank, and the roots of The Home Depot. Okay. The roots started, a very good friend of mine in Philadelphia, Gary Obam, had a chain of home centers who I had brought public called Panorama. And they were experiencing difficulties, 75, 76. And Gary had hired me as a consultant. And we were in his office one day, and I said, look, I said, we ought to have a model. If we're going to fix this, we got to look who's, who's the best out there. Now, the home center industry then was regional. You had Rickle, Pergament, Channel here. You had Heckinger's in the Mid-Atlantic. You had Scotty's in Florida. And you had Handy Dan and Angel's out in the way. He's, so Gary says, Ken, Ken is a guy out there, Bernie Marcus. He's fabulous, does a great job. I said, okay, can you get me an appointment? Long story short, the next day, I was in L.A. having lunch with Bernie Marcus. And I met him, and then and now, spectacular human being. And we bonded. And... He was running a company that was 19% owned by the public and 81% owned by an industrial company called Dalen. I ended up buying almost all of 19% in the market. I kept buying it and buying it for myself and for clients. And he persuaded me one day to sell my stock to the guy that owned 81%. And I said, look, the guy doesn't like you, and he's going to fire you. And he said, no, no, he needs me. He didn't know the business. I said, I'm telling you, I'm warning you. No. Nope. So this guy paid me a very significant premium to buy us out, all of myself and my investors. Four months after he bought us out, he fired Bernie, he fired Arthur, he fired Ron Brill. And Bernie calls me up, no health insurance, no stock, no income, three kids, I need a job. I said, forget about a job. When can you come to New York? And the next day he comes to New York. We sit in the Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria with him, myself, and a fellow by the name of Jerry Grossman, a lawyer, a labor lawyer. And they had committed a labor law violation. That's all it was, civic. Mm -hmm. It means the union gets certified. Bernie earlier had told me, we owned the stock for two years. In that two-year period, Bernie and I used to go walk store openings. When they were opening a new store, I'd go with them, and it was wonderful. And one walk in Houston, he says to me, don't get too excited because somebody's going to figure out the Achilles heel and it's going to change this industry. I don't know. He said, well, tell me. I said, tell me. No, no, I can't. I can't. I'm not going to tell you. So when he got fired, I said, he comes to New York. I said, all right, you just got hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe. Let's do that thing you said is going to change the industry. He said, what do you mean? And I t reminded him, and he said to me, let's do it. And we initially went to Perot, and it wasn't going to work. So I went and lined up 40 people that all had done very well with Handy Dan, and we put together $2 million, Arthur, Bernie, and right after we incorporated, they found another guy, a merchandise and genius by the name of Pat Farah, mm -hmm. and we brought him on board. And he, uh, he was two months after we were founded, but he was effectively one of the founders of the company as well. And the rest is history. So one thing that I found interesting was that uh, started with a, the aim was to open four stores in Atlanta. Two of them opened, but it was not so we had, we had No, hell, early on, Bernie was standing in front of the store offering people a dollar if they would walk in and look what was in the store. 
And why do you think that was? Because the concept was so new? Yeah, it was brand new. And you had this huge, and you know, we had challenges. We didn't have a lot of money. And so when they were negotiating with the vendors, we got the vendors because we didn't want to have empty shelves. They gave us empty boxes with their labels on them. So people thought we had all this merchandise and all the overheads that was air. Mm. Mm. So when did you have the sense that it was going to really be as big as it became? What was the beginning when you were sitting? When, when Bernie got fired. Talk about that. I, look, I Bernie is fabulous. And I knew Bernie was going to be a big success. And Bernie knew the business. Bernie had a great knack for having good people around him. That's critical. Mm-hmm. So I had a good start there. And Bernie had, and we still have, a very close relationship. Mm-hmm. We had to persuade Arthur to come. He was not sure he wanted to do it. Pat Farrow was running his own store, which was not was doing very well in terms of physically, but financially it was a disaster, and eventually he had to bankrupt it. It was then we got Pat to join up with us, and we did it. But I never thought we'd have 400,000 employees, but I thought we had a chance to have a great business. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Ken Langone in just a second. I know what you're thinking. This dude's a billionaire. I'm never going to be a billionaire. You know what the good news is? You don't have to be a billionaire. You really don't. All you have to do is figure out what you need and then figure out a plan to help you get there. And that is where our sponsor, Betterment, comes in. Betterment is the largest online financial advisor. Betterment's service is designed to help customers build wealth, plan for retirement, and achieve their financial goals. In other words, Betterment's mission is to help you make the most of your money. How do they do that? They take complex investing strategies. They use technology to make them more efficient. And by providing access to unlimited personalized advice from licensed experts, that gives you a game plan. How fabulous is that? And here's something that'll make you smile. At Betterment, Hidden costs are nowhere to be found, no matter who you are or how much money you invest. It could be you or it could be Ken Langone. You get everything for one low transparent management fee. Sign up today and get up to one year managed free. For more information, visit Betterment.com slash better off. That's Betterment.com slash better off. And now back to our interview with Ken Langone. So I want to talk a little bit about, I want to kind of finish the Home Depot section just by talking a little bit about how you have these founders. Obviously, it's getting big. There's different skill sets Mm -hmm. of starting something and being Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial and running a mature organization. So talk a little bit about finding Arthur's successor. Okay. Bernie, Arthur, and I had agreed that we didn't have anybody in the company that if something happened to Arthur. So we hired Hydric and Struggles. And it turns out at the time, coincidentally, I was on a board of General Electric. And this was, was, was when Jack Welch was going to make his decision about his successor. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong guy. It turned out to be a disaster. Bob Nardelli was the only one. And Bob had done a great job. I was on the board of GE and I saw the great as an operator. Yep. And this is what we needed. We, you know, we, we were growing. We, don't forget, we were opening 200 stores a year then. Staggering amount of stores. And it was getting away from us. And so we brought Bob in. In fairness, Bob did a great job for four years. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he sort of lost whatever it was. What he had done in the first four years left a lot to be desired, and we had to make a change. We had a serious morale issue in the store. Why? What do you think, in your mind, could you have identified some of Nardelli's weaknesses early on? Did you? No, and I'll tell you why. Because when he left GE... He ran a big business for GE, Power Systems. Yep. And every one of these big units, they used to have their own Christmas parties. He invited me to his last Christmas party at Power Systems up in Schenectady. The, the guy that ran the union got up and talked about there'll never be another Bob Nardelli in GE. Hmm. People were crying that he was leaving. I said, we got the guy. That's it. He said, it sounds like a rough and he tumble was, guy. But Bob, right? Bob, I can't answer it objectively. Bob got caught up in whatever it was, but it was beginning to unravel this culture, this very precious culture we had about these kids that work in the stores. These kids are special. 
We can't say enough good things about the kids that work in our stores. They're fab. I call them kids. If you're under 82, you're a kid, okay? <laughs> um, one of the things you write here on page 214 of your book, I Love Capitalism, mm-hmm. is uh, that Home Depot's great strength was and still is the culture. And the culture is not about statistics. Right. And he, you write, in our culture, you don't measure the intangible value of a sales associate saying to a customer, can I help you? Or you don't really need that. Come over here and look at this. It doesn't cost as much. You'll be fine with it. In a world where everything is an algorithm, mm-hmm. I feel like that concept of the touch mm-hmm. is underrated these days. I agree. I, so I'm wondering... What Perot, is- Perot had a culture at EDS. These guys would go through a wall. Yeah. Okay? Absolutely. It's all about the people. It, look, great companies, great pe- Why did Walmart become such a huge success at the same time Kmart was heading to bankruptcy? Same business. Same business and one culture thrives and the other one... And one didn't. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're phenomenally wealthy in the, all of these endeavors, but you're also a, a phila- philanthropist. I'm glad you know more about my net worth than I do. Cause I not... have no idea. I mean, I mean, if I, I all I, I know is I can pay my bills. That's a good thing. Okay, that's a big we, thing. Uh, it's a huge thing. Yeah, we we we're big on that on this show. Okay. Um, you know, full disclosure, everyone knows this. My dad died almost five years ago. I spent mm. so much time at NYU mm. at the hospital there, and there's your name mm. plastered on the hospital. Mm. And I want to understand number one, how did you become? Philanthropic was that something that was taught to you? I mean, you are you talk about your faith. You're Catholic. Uh-huh. You understand tithing. Uh-huh. So, what is it that that happened that that I'm brought that te- to you? I'm going to tell you a story where it really hit me. I was going to NYU at night, and this was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It was the last class we had. I went to night school to get my MBA, and I used to go to there was a corner and harder on the corner, and I used to go get a roll and a cup of coffee before I had my classes from 6 till 10. And I walked out after my class, and there was a guy panhandling. And I gave him a dollar. I didn't have much more probably than three or four bucks in my pocket. I felt so good about myself. I, I went home and I told my wife, and I said what I'd done. And I got this great sense of satisfaction and I, I don't preach to anybody about what they do with their wealth, but I look at my friend Stan Druckenmiller, Bernie, or, or all the people I know that are enormously generous with their good fortune. And I think what it did to me was it gave me, it enhanced my sense of self-worth. So now back to the, the medical center. A dear friend of mine, a wonderful man, he's a prominent lawyer, Marty Lipton. So Marty called me one day, said he needed to see him, and he comes over with the president of the university, Jay Oliva. Just before that, I was asked to become chairman of the business school mm-hmm. and of over, overseas, and I said, no, nah, other people want it. I'm, I'm happy. And Marty starts describing a mess on his hands, blah, 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 blah. And I said, wait a minute, Marty, the business school is doing great. He said, oh, I'm not talking about the business school. I'm talking about the medical school. Mm. I said, where the hell is our medical school? I didn't know we had a medical school. And he told me, and it had just merged its hospital with Mount Sinai, and all I can say is it was poisonous. It was horrible. Mm. They hated us, and we hated them, and it was a marriage from hell. Mm. And I said, Marty, this is a big thing. I want to think about it. I went home, and I told my wife that I was I was 64 years old at the time, and I said, I'm thinking about this, and I said, you know, Marty is blah, 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 blah. We have this great affection for Marty. So I spent three months, and the thing I learned, which blew my mind, the hard part was done. They had the finest doctors with the finest attitudes about patients. They had this great, great scientific professional knowledge. At the same time, they demonstrated compassion for their patients. I said, holy Christ, the hard work's done. So I decided to take it. And I said to my wife, I said, Elaine, look, if we're going to do this, I think we ought to make a nice gift. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I think we ought to give our first major gift. What do you think? And I said, let's give them $100 million. So we gave him $100 million. Unnamed. A, I, with a condition. It was to be anonymous. I didn't want people to think I was buying my job. And off to the races we went. And then the, the dean that was there then, Bob Glickman, he worked hard as it could be, and we did what we could do. The real transition occurred when Bob stepped down, and we gave Bob Grossman the job, the current dean and CEO. And then I said, then they came to me and said, look, 
you've been so good to us, we'd like to put your name, because I had the right to it. When I gave mm-hmm. him 100, I had the right, but I didn't, I didn't invoke it. And they said, I said, no, nah, no, no. And they said, look, believe me, if you let us do it, we think it'll have babies. We think it'll generate. And I said, well, I said, if you really believe that, but I said, if we're going to do it, then how about another 100? So You're my kind of guy. Well, I've been so blessed. Okay, I've been so You can't believe how good life has been to me, starting with my wife and my parents and my in-laws and my kids. So anyway, I think when I took the job in 99, it was like in the 50s, when Bob Grossman took over, we, were, we had moved up to the 30s. And just the most recent rankings, we're now third. Harvard's one, Hopkins is two, and we're third. So I want to end because Mark is obsessed with Bernie Madoff. We have had okay. Diana Henriquez, who wrote The Wizard of Lies on the program. Right. She's a friend of mine. Mm. And um, you were featured in the movie version of that. Not exactly the right way to recount the story. So, But it uh, didn't happen that way. Yeah, exactly. That's what I want. I want to hear what happened when you met Bernie okay. Madoff. 2008, in the middle of the mm, crash, the week Lehman Brothers went broke, yep. we sold a company we had a big interest in called Choice Point to Reed Elsevier for cash. And thank God for Marty Lipton and his firm, Ed Hurley and the gang. They wrote a contract with Reed Elsevier that you couldn't get a drop of water through. Mm-hmm. Reed tried to claim force majeure. Mm-hmm. And we said, uh-uh, mm-hmm. we're settling. And so we got Friday night of the same week that Lehman went broke. <laughs> You got a big wire in. We got $4.3 billion in cash. <laughs> that wasn't all ours, but we had a good piece. Yeah. A very dear friend of mine, a wonderful man, called me up and said, look, Bernie Madoff would like to meet you. This was a month and a half after that, in November. He said, why don't you meet with him? And so I have a partner that lived out in Sun Valley then, and I called up Steve Holzman, and I said, Steve, do me a favor. I said, I'm going to meet this guy Madoff. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I said, but you probably, Mike, because Steve understood all these different strategies and stuff. So Steve came in, and for the first 40, we're in his offices in the Lipstick Building on 3rd mm-hmm. Avenue. He's showing me all this art like I really care. And finally, I said, Bernie, i got to go to a dinner. And I said, can we sit down and talk? And he's sure. So he sits down, and he starts talking about this and that and the other thing and this put and that call and this straddle. And I'm sitting there. My eyes are glazing over. And Steve is listening. And then he says to me, and look, he said, I can only take $500 million for this deal. He said, it's not big enough for me to give all of my existing clients, so I'm going to give it to you. Uh, my first reaction was, wait a minute. How would I feel if I was one of his clients? And I found out he's got this phenomenal bird's nest on the ground. But he's given it to a guy he's never done business with before and keep me out of it. I didn't say anything. I said, well, Bernie, i got to leave for dinner. And so we thanked him. We got in the elevator, we went downstairs, and I said, Steve, I don't want to do business with this guy. I thanked him very much. I said, I don't want to do business with this guy. He said, why? I said, look, if he's going to screw his existing customers, I might be the next one to get screwed. I don't want to do it. I said, I think it's bad faith not to offer this deal, which is supposed to be a slam dunk deal to his people. Mm -hmm. He said, well, let me think about it. So the Friday after Thanksgiving of that week, Steve called me and said, you know, Ken, you're right. I don't want to do it. I said, well, do me a favor. Call him up and be polite and respectful. Just tell him we're going to pass. And that's how it happened. Mm. I didn't tell him he was full of shit, and I didn't call him names. Yeah. Or, Hollywood likes license. You know, they need drama. Exactly. Meeting this guy, he was teetering on the edge of... He was slick. He really? I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. He knew he was going down when he right. was talking to us. That's what I think, like, timing-wise. If I was playing poker with this guy... He'd have all my clothes. He'd have all my houses. He'd have... This guy was Mr. Cool. I want to wrap up, and um, I know that the that capitalism is sort of the theme of the book and why you love it. That's really the story of your life. I want to also point out a couple of the things. I don't know. It's graduation season, yeah. so I always like to hear some of this, that mm-hmm. you say that... Um, You have curiosity. You were notorious for asking more questions than any other director on a board. Um, I didn't give a blank if my question showed how stupid I was. You also, I guess, was interesting is that um, you note that this is not a zero-sum game. And you you say in the book you were a lifelong Republican for some time. Mm -hmm. But you also have spoken publicly about how you're concerned about income inequality. Absolutely. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. If the gap between... The well-off and the not-so-well-off gets big enough. 
you put the people that are not so well off to say, hey, you know what, nothing's working for me. What happens? You get a Cuba, you get a Venezuela, you get a Russia. We've got to figure a way out to bring everybody to the party. The, the most exciting thing to me about Home Depot, a lot of things about it, we have 3,000 kids today who started in the parking lot, fresh out of high school, pushing carts in. They're multimillionaires. They're Is that mul- because of the stock or they work yeah, their no, way no, up? No, yeah, no, totally. no, stock. No, no, we give them options and stock yeah. savings. Look, I think of my mother and father. They were down at that end of the spectrum, and I know how they struggle. Mm-hmm. We've got to do a better job. I don't have all the answers, but I know we, we can't allow these people, all of us as a citizen, as citizens, we can't allow these people to not participate in this great dream called America. That's a wonderful place to leave it. So I asked you at the beginning of the show your best financial decision. What was your worst one? Hmm. A guy showed up with an idea about fishing for anchovies off the coast of South America, shrimp in the Indian Ocean. So we, we, we banked him. And uh, the first thing that happened was the anchovy, El Nino hit. Yeah. And the anchovies went out to sea. <laughs> so we had no anchovies. And then. That, that's a pretty. That's a very odd one, but I like that. Well, you know. It's a good I, visual. God had a different plan than we did for yes. that company. Look. If you give me six months, I'll tell you about all my mistakes, yeah, all my bad deals. It seems to me that, look, and you're in a business where you do deals, they're going to be bad deals. Uh, that, you know, they, they, and you know what? The key is don't let it keep you down. I want to thank you so much for joining us. I love the book. I think you're fantastic. I also think there is a great deal of humility in the way that you tell your story. And it's, I'm very appreciative. You can imagine as someone who covers business, I meet mm-hmm. a lot of, um, how shall we say, full of themselves executives. Mm-hmm. And you're an absolute delight. And I thank you so much for letting us corral you today. I want to warn you, I have a lot of self-confidence. All right. Me too. I have a wife whose prayer every night is, Yes, dear Lord, if you'll make him successful, I'll keep him humble. <laughs> God God did his job. I keep saying to Elaine, you haven't done very well oh, so far. Oh, I, I don't believe it. Ken Langone, I'm blessed you. to be an American. Yeah. Start with that. That's okay, I'm so blessed to be an American. And you're, and sounds like you're blessed to have a family and a wife, right. a wonderful family. That's a great if thing. If we hadn't made a nickel, she'd still be there. Oh, okay? my God. And, and, and she was 16 when I met her, and I was 18, and we're married. We're going to be married 62 years. Poor, poor kid from Roslyn Heights marries, marries a, a nice girl, girl from Manhasset. Manhasset right. My God. I traded up. It's a love story. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to Ken Langone. What a treat. I'm really trying to wrangle an invitation to have eggplant parmesan at his house because he says he makes the best eggplant parmesan in the world. I'll let you know how that goes. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of Better Off every Tuesday and Thursday. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is the executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13 and we're sponsored by Betterman. See you next week.